run into too. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we just uh, go ahead, Jason? As like I say, additional people will come on. Um, our uh, uh, honored guest uh, today in the uh, Lunch and Learn series is uh, Dr. Chase Mayers from uh, Cornell University. He's an alum of Iowa State University uh, with a, a PhD in the plant pathology microbiology department with Tom Harrington and uh, got uh, involved uh, heavily there. And, and I think even before that, um, Chase in, in teaching and uh, at Cornell University, he's a teaching support specialist and he's gonna talk to us uh, about some of the uh, innovative stuff that he's involved with, with uh, um, uh, with teaching there. So uh, Chase, welcome. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mark, and, and thanks for uh, reaching out. I, I was really happy to come and talk about teaching um, because you're right, teaching has been something I was interested in from the very first time I applied to grad school. It was something I wrote heavily into my narrative uh, when applying. It was something I kind of took interest in sitting in a classroom, I think sophomore year uh, of undergrad down at LSU. Um, I realized it was something that I wanted to do. And, and uh, in retrospect, I'm, I'm extremely grateful for all the teaching resources available at Iowa State for support for graduate students and faculty alike, whether it's the Preparing Future Faculty Program, from which I learned a great deal, uh, the, the, the many teaching interested uh, faculty in the vicinity of the plant pathology department where I was hosted, and uh, things like the Active Learning Institute. So um, I thought, let, let me talk a little bit about kind of my idea for what I was going to talk about today, um, and then uh, kind of where I've been at the last few years and why uh, I feel that I've learned something that's worth sharing with regards to engaging plant pathology in the virtual classroom. And uh, I kind of see two meanings to this title. One is making um, the actual student learning engaging for the students uh, in that they're, they're learning something from it and they're active and they're not just um, doing glorified um, video watching in the classroom, which are YouTube watching, right? Which was, I think, something that was, uh, uh, at least to me, a fear at the beginning. Uh, can we provide them something that is functionally different than just throwing them some YouTube links? Um, but also in engaging plant pathology in the virtual classroom in, in that we're actually <laughs> remembering that there should be plant pathology in the classroom and, and pathology being something that's so hands-on and interactive. Uh, and virtual demonstration being something that's so demonstrative and visual, how can we keep that, that back and forth, that hands-on interactive nature? So uh, what I have here is a pretty informal presentation. It's adapted somewhat from uh, what I presented at APS this year related to virtual teaching methods, which is why I have so much information uh, on the technology, especially used in methods. But I'd also just kind of try to, try to like to talk broadly about some of the awesome, um, other aspects of virtual teaching that I ran into and my thoughts on that. So I think to contextualize this, uh, let me talk about what, what I, where I'm at here and what I do. So um, starting in about August 2020, fall 2020, I began a, a full-time teaching position here, uh, which is a combination of course pedagogical development uh, and innovative, innovative course design uh, and teaching support. And uh, this is a difficult position to to summarize, it certainly isn't helped with the name teaching support specialist. Teaching needs all kinds of support, right? What it really means is I'm in charge of lab components for three different lecture courses, um, designing the labs for those courses, training and being in charge of the TA teams for those courses, but also designing course material and pedagogy for both lectures and labs. And I do this in collaboration with different professors for each of these courses. Um, you might recognize August 2020 as an interesting time on the uh, pandemic timeline. For us, that was our first fully virtual semester. So I went into my first semester teaching uh, with it also being uh, the first time Cornell had fully virtually gone into the pandemic. So let me uh, intro you a little bit to what these courses are. Um, three courses, all very different in scope and, uh, and, and uh, I guess mission. And so the first is mycology. This is a general mycology course, similar very much to uh, the mycology course I took with Leonor back at Iowa State and then got to uh, teach with uh, alongside uh, Hafizi. Uh, it's a four credit class, three hour lecture, one hour lab, but only about 15 students. This is a pretty small audience, but a pretty advanced one. So the lecture itself is extremely dense. This is taxonomy of fungi, deep concepts into fungi. And the lab is very much on the specifics of mycology in the laboratory, microscopy, culturing, et cetera. 
There's also a plant pathology course. Oh, I should say, mycology is done in conjunction with, uh, with faculty Teresa Pulaska here. Plant pathology, which is uh, I do in, in, in a team with Carrick Cox, uh, is again, four credit, three hours lecture, one hour lab, but very different. It's around 40 students, and many of them have specific plans on taking this knowledge to the future. Um, all of you will be well aware of this with plant pathology and the, the, the hands-on nature needed for those techniques and, and for demonstration. And uh, when I was coming in, I was told these labs were very heavily field-based, field trips, field excursions, field plants. Um, and the lab was, uh, was kind of free form where students would uh, kind of infect their own diseases and have a bit of a sandbox. And finally, magical mushrooms, mischievous molds, which is I teach in conjunction with faculty Kathy Hodge. Uh, this is a four credit, again, three hour lecture, one hour lab, but with 400 students, these are general ed students from across the entire university. This is a broad perspective on mycology that is meant to teach people from all backgrounds and just introduce them to mycology. The labs are a huge undertaking. We have six sections. I have 12 TAs, uh, six graduates and six undergraduates uh, who all need to be coordinated to uh, deliver class material to uh, labs packed to the brim with these, these students. And uh, if you ask me which of these was the most challenging to, uh, to deal with in a pandemic, I'd actually have a difficult time uh, saying which, but I think this one's certainly the one that was the most volume. So uh, let me give you the COVID perspective a little bit here, because I know in, uh, in a way that's a little subtly different than Ames as well. So Cornell has done a pretty good job of tracking COVID uh, in town for the most part. That may or may not be the reason why we've hit national news twice for, for outbreaks here, both the start of Omicron and then again at the start of the BA2 variant this semester. Um, I'll actually increase the window here. Um, you can see we've certainly gone through troughs and we've gone through spikes. For the most part, we've been fairly lucky here. Um, but Cornell's policy has been very strict, both in the research and the teaching since. Um, by the end of March 2020, uh, we had full, absolute lockdown on campus. Classes had to suddenly move to fully virtual teaching. Undergraduates were not allowed in laboratories, and uh, no research was allowed in laboratories either outside of uh, completely essential work to keep cultures up, for example. Research didn't continue for several months, um, but teaching was fully virtual for an entire year. That means both fall 2020 and spring 2021 was then uh, partially virtual and partially in person last fall, and this semester is our first time back in person, although we've had a few uh, jumps back to virtual, including last week, where uh, in wake of the VA2 variant, we decided to uh, move to virtual again. But that wasn't a Cornell decision. That was a independent decision on our part. So with all that in context, that means I traveled all three of these courses fully virtually between fall 2020 and spring 2021. And uh, I want to go into most detail on the plant pathology course here, biology and management of plant diseases, since uh, I'm talking to a bunch of plant pathology folks, right? So in a typical semester, it's traditional lecture with active learning components. I love active learning. Uh, I don't want to make this into a uh, active learning advertisement. In fact, I believe um, Holly Bender gave a seminar in the Plant Path Seminar in 2015, extolling the values of active learning, team-based learning. Um, but the again, like I said, the lab included field trips and self-scheduled lab time. Field trips clearly weren't going to happen in the pandemic, and uh, they were even difficult when we returned in person because of seating limits inside uh, university buses. So for fall 2020, uh, when we went fully virtual, we chose to have synchronous lecture with team-based active learning uh, via breakout rooms. And let me say, uh, I'm so appreciative of breakout rooms uh, in Zoom, uh, especially their improved implementation as the pandemic went on. Uh, for replacing a lot of things we lost in the move to virtual. I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, we decided to also have synchronous labs with small sections, um, with sections that were the same as the section students would break out to in the lecture. The hope there is that they would get to know each other, have a little bit of uh, camaraderie and uh, some kind of human connection <laughs> by being in these breakout rooms. And I'll come back to human connection in a bit. And so uh, the live interaction, uh, interactive streams replace hands-on labs. And I'll get more into detail later, but what we decided to do was to actually up our TA team to eight with two grads and six undergraduate students. We were further divided between two campuses. Uh, Cornell has a separate ag and main campus. So we had half of our teaching team at the Geneva campus and half at the Ithaca campus. We were teaching eight sections 
two simultaneously at both Geneva and Ithaca at the same time. We were moving sick plants uh, the hour trip both ways each week and making sure we had uh, materials in both places and we were teaching uh, separately and simultaneously. The reason for this was we thought the smaller section size would allow more direct contact between TA and students in a virtual environment. You might have noticed it's really hard to connect with a large group in Zoom, whether it's been at conferences or in class. And I got to say, APS did a really interesting job of, uh, of uh, getting around this with the whole, I don't know how many of you experienced this. Uh, Mark, I know I went and talked to you in the teaching bubble because you got a, um, you would become a little circle and you could move virtually in a, in a 2D space and you could move to other people's circles with their face pictures and start to talk with them. Um, but I contrast that with, I think, what a mycological society, a huge single room with a bunch of people in video chat, very difficult to have uh, these separate conversations. So uh, we thought it was a success, even though it was a lot to uh, have eight sections when the course was used to having only two and to coordinate the simultaneous delivery. But uh, I don't think that there was any other way we were ever gonna get full participation in interactive labs, which is when we would have a camera ready at the bench. And I'll show you examples of this later. And we would wait for the students to tell us what to do next. We were basically their voice control robots doing the protocols and procedures in an attempt to involve the students somewhat in the process of science, not just the material. One of the really difficult things to uh, communicate in labs. Um, active learning replacing class discussions. Discussions, the time where students can teach each other and actually exchange uh, ideas, I thought was even easier with breakout rooms. Um, it was easy to send students out, bring them back. Um, I won't elaborate on this uh, now. And uh, we moved to self-guided forays in place of field trips, which I'll, again, I'll, uh, I'll touch on later. But all, I think, importantly, all these adaptations teach us something about teaching that is still useful in the new normal moving forward. And so I want to talk a little bit about that too. What, what, what can we bring forward that, that we, we learned? And so I think this was a really convenient time to move to virtual teaching. Uh, thanks to the rise of YouTube streaming, video game streaming, Twitch streaming, um, not to mention hobbyist videography, cell phones and the like, uh, we, there's no better time to get uh, hobbyist streaming and video tools. And so uh, it was relatively easy, even on teaching funds, to put together uh, what really felt sometimes like a movie studio more than a, a classroom. I had, I literally had lights, I had uh, cameras, and I was providing the action at the bench. And uh, thank goodness for, for easily acceptable, uh, accessible consumer technology, which I'll talk about in a bit. And uh, what I'm really excited about is the pretty simple equipment setup I came up with that allows field recording and field uh, participation, which we've continued to use even live. I want to bring up this the study cycle. Um, this is something produced at LSU, again, my alma mater. But uh, it's not homerism. I, I actually like LSU's concept here. This is something originally created by uh, Frank Chris. Uh, a little while back, um, because I think the pandemics has uh, has affected each of these stages differently for both us and for students. And it's easy to just focus on the presentation portion of, of, of teaching, which is what I'm going to focus on the most today. But um, you can't deny that there's been significant impacts on how students review, how students access material afterwards, um, and how students reflect that material back during assessment. Um, and I have some thoughts on all of that, but my main points I want to get across today. What are some of the challenges of teaching in a pandemic? What are some of the ways uh, we can solve those for plant pathology? And what can we learn from those to uh, bring forward into the new normal, whatever that's going to look like? And I know this isn't an unusual thought in, the, in your department. Uh, in fact, some of your own faculty have published on exactly this recently, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more of this coming out of the pandemic. But again, I'm not, I'm not looking for this to be an academic style talk. This is informal, right? So I just want to talk about uh, what worked for us and, and how I feel about it. And if I could divide some of the teaching challenges um, from the back end, it kind of divides into this. Content delivery, the most obvious, but also assessment, assessing student uh, performance, social interaction, and logistics. Um, I'm going to elaborate on content delivery for the rest of the most of the rest of the talk today, but I want to briefly touch on the other ones, um, even though I don't have any pretty graphics to go along with it. Assessment. I think one of the first things I'm constantly uh, colliding with with people is the anxiety of collusion. Students working together for quizzes and exams. How can we prevent 
collusion when students are accessing material in an online world. And I've seen kind of two approaches to this. It's like a, uh, it's like a mountain. The wind's got to go either one way or the other with it, right? You either lean into it and take advantage of the fact that students are already going to be on technology and have communication with each other, or you go strongly in the other direction and do everything you can to make things more difficult for them so that they cannot collude. So the difficult direction, you may have seen, um, well, I'm sure none of you use this, uh, the news about eye tracking software to make sure a student doesn't look away from their exams or <laughs> computer monitoring software to make sure students don't change windows or use chat programs. And uh, I don't think it's controversial to say that in my opinion, those are pretty abhorrent and are only making a, a pretty a pretty distance and uh, impersonal pandemic even worse. Um, other methods can include careful use of deadlines, uh, careful windows for releasing content, mixing question banks. We've actually had really good success in the 400 student class with mixing question banks and in changing the order questions are given. And uh, you can even do more intricate, there's a more intricate process in which you strategically give students access to certain questions um, while also uh, stepwise offsetting their quiz start time based on their current classroom performance so that the flow of information can only go from the bottom up for students in the class. <laughs> this isn't something we actually did, but it's an actual strategy that exists out there and can be automated. Um, and so that you make sure that if even all the students were in the worst case scenario, one huge chat room with the same quizzes, the worst case scenario is that information would flow up the grade curve, so to speak. We didn't go that far. But the other side of it is to lean into it, to um, allow students to work together, to use group-based methods. And that's what we did in plant pathology. We replaced the exams with group-based exams, questions that were significantly harder and that relied on exams, but leveraged students' uh, uh, collective knowledge and collective uh, insight to actually work together uh, and, and apply content. And we relied really heavily on group work and group assignments uh, rather than individual quizzes as, as well. There's also the classic IRAT TRAT strategy. This is part of the canonical TBL, team based learning system, uh, since you, Nicholson, and Sweet. It's what's currently used uh, at ISU by several faculty. Uh, Leonor and I introduced this in the mycology class years ago. It's still used to an extent. But in that system, you have students take the quiz individually and commit to their own grade, and then immediately take the same quiz with a group and submit a second time. And the student's grade comes from both. The group then teaches and makes up for each other's misconceptions and ends up interteaching with each other, which reinforces learning all around and prevents you from having to teach through small misconceptions. But it also reduces collusion because students have a reduced reason to want to reach out. And I don't like to use the word cheat, but to collude uh, when they know they're going to do the group work after. OK, we're almost past the. Uh, the fun graphics desert, I promise. I just, there's no funny pictures to talk about collusion. I'll just imagine a little spy, I guess, sneaking across uh, the computer screen. But for social interaction, I think this is something that gets left out a lot is the human element. I don't know about you, but I find it really hard to connect casually and socially through Zoom. Um, in the classroom, something I think we took for granted for a long time was those little interactions before and after the lecture those little human pieces of contact, not just us to students, but also student to student. And this is something that students just totally lost while they were stuck in their dorms, uh, relegated to Zoom, where everything's all business from, from start to finish. One of the ways, well, two of the ways we got around this. One, leaving breakout rooms open a little too long with the hope that students could have a little bit of idle conversation. Like I said, keeping breakout rooms consistent between lecture and laboratory so student, and across the semester so students could at least have some kind of consistent social groups. And uh, as I'll talk about later, encouraging field trips uh, and for them to do it socially distanced and together so they can have a little bit of uh, contact. Okay, so uh, logistics, I don't need to talk much about that except that, uh, my goodness, was it difficult riding the price wave, especially with gloves uh, and other materials and delays. Uh, while keeping things stocked and ready. Thankfully, we were also using a lot less. Um, but lecture was one thing. So changing content delivery, let's get back to content delivery, the first one, what I wanna focus on. It's easy enough to just change how you deliver material. We're going to go from lecture to computers. And again, thank goodness for 
breakout rooms. But a lab isn't just about changing how you deliver material because we don't just sit in front of a lab and lecture usually. We had to think really deeply about what do we want the students to get out of the labs, not just knowledge and content, but hands-on experience and familiarity with the methods and troubleshooting skills, being able to uh, figure out what can go wrong and why and get around it, things they can actually use in the future in their jobs. And these are extremely difficult to deliver virtually. Um, so one of the things, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we decided to go towards was live laboratory demonstration. And this is what did the vast majority of our demonstration in uh, plant pathology. We had a webcam on a gooseneck situated over the table. Here you can see one of my uh, TAs, Will Gura, in the middle of uh, a class in progress. By being on a gooseneck, the camera was able to move into the specimens, move around the desk, but also with a hinge, it could be flipped up to the face and, and back again. Uh, you know, it's not a sitcom. We don't have a two camera situation. Uh, and again, we had these uh, LED lights for, for lighting. This is a setup you'll often see on YouTube tutorials, whether it's cooking or crafting. And uh, you can see uh, this allowed us really agile movement between faces for, for, for lecturing. Um, there's me at the bottom. I, I, I would lecture the first section uh, each week. Um, and then the bench, we could just flip it right down and then boom, there's some corn smut that we can demonstrate under the camera. Um, this worked really well for us. And uh, sometimes we would use tripod mounts instead if uh, we needed to demonstrate something not at our, our dedicated teaching bench, which uh, in my case was a part of my, my prep lab that we've cleared away for that purpose. On the left, uh, that was the Geneva campus setup. Uh, there's another TA demonstrating potato rot. You can actually see the student's view on the screen and how they were seeing this hands-on demo. And on the right uh, is me in the middle of demonstrating soil sieving for, uh, for AMF, and then I did similar for, for nematode sieving as well. Uh, this was an interesting setup because uh, I often made use of dual Zoom uh, logins. I had just said this isn't a sitcom with two cameras, but uh, it can be if you need it to. Here, I actually have my cell phone separately logged into Zoom, uh, which at the moment is I'm just using to see the students, but which you can also turn the camera on and, and give them a simultaneous second view. I've also got the laptop down below, um, which is connected to a webcam on a tripod, and uh, which is at the very top on a ball joint. And that was needed to quickly move between the sink and the, uh, the processing area. And uh, so it looks a little awkward from this angle, which is why <laughs> I couldn't help get a picture. But it was effective. Uh, it worked in the moment. So uh, I can't stress lighting enough. And uh, it's, it's useful that uh, I had some unexpected but uh, I guess unusual previous experience with videography coming into this. Uh, and so I'm gonna briefly uh, change shares here. Uh, so, okay, I see in the chat, Claudia had to head out, but I, I did want to shout out very briefly um, some of the experiences I had before that unexpectedly prepared me for this. So uh, Claudia mentioned the ag discovery experience right before uh, this. And uh, I had in the past done some videography for this outreach program uh, at Iowa State. Hopefully that's uh, coming through on the share uh, where I edited these videos together for this uh, high school outreach program. And uh, it was awesome experience. It was uh, summer funding for sure, but great to be involved in teaching. But also uh, I had filmed this uh, this microbiology video library for the micro department, which is still up even today. And uh, I'm not sure if I hadn't, oh, apologies uh, if that video is still out. If I hadn't had this experience, I'm not sure if I would have been ready to uh, immediately jump into with about three weeks notice, um, fully videoing and preparing and uh, planning these videos. But uh, I think it's good experience to have for teaching, uh, even in a non-pandemic context. And uh, I'll explain a little bit why moving forward. So, uh, but lighting, I don't know that I would have had lighting theory in mind without it. And gosh, does it make a difference? It's the difference between seeing the detail and the streaking on a leaf uh, and seeing just a really dark shaded piece of, of plant without much context. And these, these LED lights are just so, so cheap. And uh, it really just takes two. 
So that was our um, lab bench setup. We also uh, made use of a field recording setup. And uh, this was interesting. It uses a selfie stick off of Amazon that would actually hold a cell phone. And the neat thing about the selfie stick is at the bottom, it could open up into a tripod and you could set the selfie stick down and, and leave the camera in place. And so uh, combined with the Bluetooth headset and a cell phone, this entire thing was uh, fully mobile and allowed for some uh, out of the classroom demonstration and experiences with students. And uh, this worked not only pre-recorded, but live. And so I have an example here. And uh, I'm going to switch the sound sharing on, but uh, the sound I'm is not so important. Field hall. So here you can see uh, one great example. In this case, this was from a city of my seats. I was able to place the tripod down and then walk away and demonstrate something while still coming through thanks to the, the Bluetooth microphone. We'll see. Um, it's not smooth at all. And I was also able to show close-up detail using a method I'll talk about in a bit uh, to also connect students to the macroscopic world, something they're missing majorly uh, in a distance context. I'm looking at the chat. Chase. I'm the YouTube page. Oh. My bad. Thanks for letting me know. OK. So that should be coming through now, right? You should see me looking goofy uh, with a mushroom mask. <laughs> My bad about that. So anyway, the uh, the mobile setup allowed me to uh, talk and then actually set the camera down and uh, directly walk right away. Now, I should have had the Bluetooth headset. This is one case where I didn't. Um, but in every other case I used this, the Bluetooth let me keep talking to the students even when uh, I walked away from the camera. And uh, there's a magical thing here where using an, a simple hand lens, I was able to uh, also connect at the macroscopic level, something the students miss out on uh, themselves. So yeah, here we were able to go all the way down. So that was pretty useful. Um, the tripod in general allowed really quick mobility. Uh, here's a case of finding some coleosporum rust um, but this is all something we usually would have taken the students around in person and, and demonstrated to them. And uh, this was the closest thing we thought we could come up with uh, to replace that experience. Obviously, it still doesn't fully replace it, but it's something. Okay. So, uh, and again, also, uh, even though that was pre recorded and given to the students in class, we had several cases of success with live demonstration, including once during a rainstorm uh, in an umbrella um, with a little walk around and showing off some diseases uh, because we couldn't take the students to the field ourselves. Although um, to do this requires careful understanding of where there's internet, whether it's cell service or otherwise, and uh, we didn't have super great success with cell. But in the new normal, what can this do that benefits us? In a laboratory sense, I think it unlocks what we can demonstrate to the students, either in the lab or the lecture. Um, especially in plant pathology and mycology, I think we're often locked into not only space, but, but time, how, how the seasons change, what is current and available. There's a reason plant pathology courses are often taught in the fall, right? Same with, with many mycology courses. But by using these kinds of pre-recorded um, tools, we can expand the what. We can bring students material too large or rare or delicate to bring to the classroom. Uh, so um, uh, a fungus that doesn't remain intact, a fungus that's uh, too large to remove from a tree. We can expand the where. Um, we don't have to take students to every single spot, material that's too far away, difficult location. Um, in our cases in town, places where we've got permits to go ourselves, but not to bring students. And, uh, and then when material that's in the wrong season. We struggle with this, with this 400 student magical mushrooms course because we teach it now in the spring, not in the fall. And uh, we rely on freeze drying mushrooms. We rely on negative 80 freezing. I know, uh, I wonder how things are going for y'all down there. We don't get mushrooms for a while, probably not till the end of April if we're lucky here. And um, so it's hard, we have to use preserved things. But you could at least with this record something and, and, and provide it to them and something unique to their area. For microscopic demonstration, I tried a lot of different options for this and, I, and I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages in a bit, but we settled on a dino eye ocular camera and uh, what a lovely piece of equipment this is. Rather than a C-mount, uh, you don't have to thread or unscrew, you can quickly remove it from a lens and switch to another, which let us 
switch live from um, microscopes to dissecting scopes during demonstration. And because it's USB, Zoom recognizes it natively. There's no proprietary drivers like you get with some of the more expensive brands and you don't have to use any special software. You could just directly switch to it in Zoom, uh, which was great. And so um, I evaluated a bunch of options for this. And I guess I'll just say here, in my opinion, there's just nothing better than using these, these, these cheap USB ocular cameras. I did try some of the, there's these little almost pin light looking, flashlight looking macro lenses. I found them really finicky. I found the Dino Y in combination with scopes by far the most reliable thing. Um, I had a, uh, a C-mount camera, again, way too finicky. It was a research grade camera for the purpose of quality, not frame rate. It did not stream well and it was really unwieldy. Weirdly, I found cell phone uh, hand lens usage to be one of the best protocols and techniques. And one of the ones we ended up using the most in class by simply holding a hand lens up to a cell phone camera, you can get incredible results. And that applies over Zoom too. There were times where I had a whole lab set up with specimens, wood decay, for example. I had whole tables of wood decay material and I was taking the students around on a cell phone on Zoom and then zooming in with a hand lens to show them detail and to uh, talk about the things close up. And so, I can demonstrate right now. Check out this very cute little mushroom fellow. Uh, if you wanted to get a closer look at the materials, it works with webcams too. I'm just holding the lens up and you get a sense of the texture and the makeup of the gills. In the most extreme sense, we had success showing rust, for example, on leaves. Gills of mushrooms with enough resolution to actually see uh, spores on the very edges of them and uh, a number of other really incredible things. Um, so yeah, just to give you an idea of how great these dino eyes work, this is live footage. It's very high frame rate, it's very high resolution. And uh, honestly, I don't know if we could have taught mycology without this kind of uh, technology. We spent so much time uh, in this space demonstrating Canidia for mythology and, and so many other things. Um, for macroscopic demonstration, like I said, hand lens, it works wonders. There's some chasmothecia from, uh, from a leaf uh, as an example. Uh, also, I, uh, I eventually ended up investing in this tablet here. This is a really special model. This is a Samsung model that's been discontinued, but uh, it's the only one in the market recently with a bright enough screen to really use in the sunlight. And uh, I had the joy of using this in person in the field this year with Plant Path. And what it let me do is use the hand lens technique go right up to a plant and then have that rust or have that, um, that, that those little tiny apothecia on the screen and have a whole group of students around me looking at it and, and demonstrate right there in the field when we were at the farms uh, or on location. So there's one of the examples of, to me, something I'm gonna keep using moving forward that I, I don't know that I would have learned if, if I hadn't been pushed by the pandemic. Um, Pre-film produced video is not something we did a lot, but properly filmed uh, edited and uh, processed video. Again, thank goodness I had the experience from Ag Discovery. Um, but I want to talk about how we use them in the class to try to replace some of the harder parts of class, the uh, hands-on and the troubleshooting parts. And so here we have a sick potato infected. We would often use narrated videos. Pathogen. Again, hopefully that audio is coming through. Uh, where we would narrate through everything that we were doing by the unknown pathogen. And uh, by using multiple camera angles, we really get pretty detailed with this. An empty, sterile petri plant. But I'm just going to mute it while I talk. We would use these in a flipped classroom context where students would watch them before so that they were familiar with the protocols. And then uh, in class, like I said, we would be live doing the protocols, but we would ask the students to guide us through them. If they gave us mistaken directions, we would produce mistaken results and then talk through why that happened. And they used these narrated videos to prepare them for that. And this was our way to connect them with content um, and hands-on uh, familiarity, as well as um, a way to connect them with problem solving uh, about what could go wrong. And, and this worked pretty well for plant pathology where we had some very specific techniques uh, to demonstrate to the students. Um, we also worked with non-narrated videos. So there's no narration whatsoever here. And we used pause and discuss for this. So, uh, we would pause at different parts of the video and then ask the students to uh, discuss with us um, what could go wrong if we did this? Why are we doing this? 
what is this for? And we, we found this worked better for the magic mushrooms class with the students with a much more diverse background and without really much bio training coming in. Uh, we found this engaged them again on, the, on, on what we really wanted them to get from the class, which is just very basic understanding of why we, we do what we do in, in laboratories. Um, autoclaving, for example, was a great one. Uh, it made a big difference to be able to pause and play at the different stages of autoclaving and bounce that off the students. Why are we doing this? Uh, yeah, and that was effective in magic machines, much just molds. But something this didn't solve at all is hands-on experience. And I can't say this is something we ever solved 100%. If any of you have, have, have solutions to this, I'd be happy to hear them. I saw there, uh, one of the things that sticks out to me is microscope skills. We saw students this semester and the advanced courses coming in way more unprepared for microscopes than usual because they weren't getting that in their basic courses. And, you know, we did use a 3D online simulator that let the students control a, a, a 3D microscope. It's not the same. They're not making mistakes with the lenses. They're not making mistakes with oil. Um, they're not getting that trial and error mistake learning. Um, one thing we did have success with was take home experience, trying to send the lab home as much as we could. And so in collaboration with the library, we had a no contact pickup set up for some of the labs where uh, we had students take yeast plates home that had been treated with different um, antifungals and then watch them grow in their bedrooms and then record the colony number and, and just get that, that visual firsthand experience. We had students take slime mold pets home and watch them create networks between food sources. We had students take home mushroom grow bags and grow mushrooms at home. We had students take home uh, uh, these uh, mycelial bricks that they could dry and make materials. Here you can see here's a bowl made out of it. Um, just any way to have students do something at home to get their hands on, on the material. We had them go out and find diseases and report on them and touch them and photograph them. Uh, it's connection, just trying to get the students connected to the material in any way possible. And uh, I briefly want to talk about accessibility because this is a big, this has been a big thing on my mind all pandemic. And uh, I think it relates certainly to videos, but also to lecturing, particularly with regards to captioning. Um, for us, we at least didn't have dedicated captioning staff. And so we had to caption all of our material ourselves, um, whether this was after the fact for lectures, which takes about one hour uh, in my experience, um, or pre-captioning any videos used in the class. And uh, I know I got much better at it over the pandemic and at least our resources improved. There was automatic captioning and it's much improved with custom databases. Um, but I guess something I want to stress is uh, we learned a lot about making material accessible during the pandemic. And for a certain subset of students, uh, material during the pandemic was more accessible than it's ever been before. I think it's worth keeping that in mind moving forward and making sure that we don't forget that and going back to um, leaving those students a bit high and dry again and trying to uh, keep using some of these technologies, which are better than ever now after the pandemic, to, to, to keep things accessible. And, and this ranges from everything from reconsidering how you deliver online material to your students and how much online material uh, you offer to the, uh, the assignment flexibility we often uh, had to resort to during the pandemic. I don't get a chance to elaborate on this later in the talk, but um, to get around student, a different student accessibility to uh, just reality, we had a pick and choose component for our 400 student course where yes, they could go out and make observations of fungi uh, for the grade, but we knew some students were back across the ocean in places that weren't conducive at that time of the year. We knew some students were in isolation. Um, asking them to go out into nature and do this didn't seem right. So we gave them a slate, this, 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 this option of what we called quests, and they could choose the one they were most able to do. They were all about equal in difficulty. Whether it was uh, pursuing a single species of fungi and doing a uh, taxonomic perspective mini essay, whether it was drafting a letter to their congressman about uh, mycological, mycological related uh, policy, especially for those business majors that was popular, whether it was making a piece of art relating to fungi, um, giving students options is, is also um, an accessibility boon. It's not just a, something that lets you get around pandemic realities. And so uh, I also, something I've been thinking a lot about during the pandemic is when we design labs, thinking about practice versus exposure, how much do we actually want students to get practice on versus how much is it really important that we show them and that, that they learn 
that we often limit ourselves in designing labs, I think too much by the, uh, the, the former in service of the latter. And so as, a, and as an example, imagine an ASCO my seat lab. This is, imagine hypothetically, this is the first time the students have ever used microscopes and you would like them to learn about Ascomycetes yeasts, as well as Ascomycetes anamorphs, as well as Ascomycetes teleomorphs. Aside from the fact that this should never be packed into a single lab, this should be like three at a minimum, how in the world will you both teach them microscope skills, but also show them the whole diversity within these groups? At, if you're gonna have them prepare their own slides from every single one, maybe at max, you get two examples for each of them. Maybe you get Saccharomyces and skip to Saccharomyces so that they can see budding yeasts and uh, chisogenous yeasts. Maybe you show them a uh, phthalid style anamorph and a uh, arthrosporic breaking anamorph. Maybe you show them a parathecium of sordaria and then realistically run out of time because the students have run out of time. And maybe if you're asking them to write and illustrate, they're probably rushing the entire time and not really appreciating what they're seeing under the scope. At least this is what I've observed when we've tried to pack uh, too many observations under one time. I think one thing that we can really use from the pandemic are these technologies to demonstrate and that you can use that in the classroom to get around the fact that students have to do everything themselves. So imagine a case where you only have the students prepare X number and only spend the class time focusing on doing those really well, but then you have microscopes set up and projecting to the projector or microscope stations ready with computer screens uh, where they can go in and view those without spending the time to make them. I, this seems like a really basic thing, but this has come up to me over and over again in designing these labs because we found out we were covering more material virtually than had typically been done in person in almost all of the labs. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, yeah, it's just considering balance between how much you make the students repeat in the name and uh, the chase of, of material and not. Uh, Mark, how am I doing on time? Is this a, a 45 minute deal or? or you know, you've, got, uh, you've got about uh, 13 minutes uh, till, one, till uh, the hour here, Chase. Great, well, I was hoping we could have a little bit of chat. So I think I'll speed through the rest. Um, I cannot, uh, I can't extol iNaturalist enough. I, 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 what a wonderful place um, to get students out in the field engaged. If you're not familiar with iNaturalist, uh, it's a wonderful app and website. You take photos, whether it's a phone or otherwise, and uh, you submit them. It's photos of insects, plants, fungi, anything. Uh, an artificial intelligence attempts uh, to identify what you have by, by, by AI, you post it to a community with your GPS coordinates and date already baked in. It places it on a map in an interactive um, site where other users can see them and comment. And you need a consensus of agreed identifications before it becomes research quality. This helps uh, students learn about what's around them. But this was our most successful strategy for getting students to go look at and touch and feel diseases. We had an assignment where by the end of the semester, they had to report X number of rusts, X number of wood diseases, X number of leaf diseases, X number of uh, miscellaneous fungi as part of this iNaturalist portfolio by the end of the semester. And uh, we would uh, work with them on identification during. And this got them out there seeing the stuff in person. And I think that's different at a fundamental level than seeing it through a video camera uh, through the internet. Um, we've also used it to just excite students in general in the, uh, in the 400 student general class. Um, yeah, I, I just want to kind of, instead of uh, dwelling on that, to, to just really briefly um, wrap up. For one, this whole experience was really difficult. I don't think students got the ex experience. Uh, they didn't get quite the experience that students did in the past. And I don't think we did either. I don't know about you, but in my experience, uh, I get a lot more uh, energy from seeing students learn in the classroom from like resonating back with seeing them connect than uh, the often really impersonal black boxes of Zoom. And so I think it's been a really hard time on both sides of the, uh, the camera, so to speak. And I, I don't think that's quite back to normal yet. Uh, we're at least here still required to wear masks. And that emotional connection between students and teacher and, and, and actually sensing where students are at and responding to that during teaching has been, in my experience, just as hard through masks as it has been through the camera. But uh, at least we can, at least hopefully uh, content was delivered somehow. I think, and I've seen incredible efforts, um, Herculean efforts across the board on the internet of how people adapted to uh, 
delivering content. And so um, I can't say like what we came up with is the only answer, but it's my experience. And I think it's the best we could do. And, and I prefer to look at what our students got as a glass half full than glass half empty. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the full glass of the pre times, but uh, I mean, pretty full, pretty full glass. And we got a lot of good comments and feedback from students. So yeah, I, that's, uh, that's what I've gone through. I, I'm curious if there's any thoughts or like other people's experiences on how things worked for you. If not, I have a few uh, example videos to show off. But. Questions, thank you, Chase. Questions for Chase. Yeah. Really inspiring presentation, by the way. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, Chase, thanks for the presentation. I, I'm, uh, you mentioned that uh, you noticed that students were struggling with uh, microscopy skills, right? Having not had that hands-on experience. Yes. Uh, did they know that? And uh, what, what did you sense? Was their, was their level of engagement any different having not had the hands-on uh, skills or experience? I, uh, I felt the engagement was lacking, but I think it's really hard to, to gauge engagement. Are the students really engaged when we're watching them in the classroom and they're, uh, you know, they're going through the motions on the microscope? Uh, I think it's hard to say. Um, and the students weren't telling us. Well, we did actually. We got a few students saying they were disappointed. They, oh, I would like to go to work on, uh, in forest pathology. I would have really liked to have experience handling the material and, and digging into it. I would have liked to have much experience with the microscope. Um, but I think it's hard to define engagement with microscopes. Something we did do in the smaller class was uh, open the lab up at certain times for uh, measured uh, experience where there weren't too many students at the same time so that they could use the microscopes a little for the mycology course. But we had a limit of seven students in what was before a pretty large classroom. And uh, that just didn't work for, for plant path. But certainly I think the engagement was a lot less. I think we had to continually bring students in with like group work and we had to constantly ask them to talk and participate and be present. And uh, I could talk for another hour about why I think team-based learning was a magic cure to that. But um, yeah, it's difficult. And maybe just another, another quick question too, but with the, um the uh, two-stage uh, exam or test format. So um, I've also used that in a class of uh, 250 or so. And again, um, uh, and even trying to do that during the pandemic. And uh, I'm curious what your experience was with um, student uptake with that. So not uptake, but we got a lot of pushback. So uh, a lot of the A plus students felt that they were being penalized by having to do this, right? Because the students were sort of doing it as zero sum game. And so yes. we, had, we had to do a lot of, in fact, we, we showed the data to the students to uh, try to convince them to buy into why this was working for them. Was that similar to your experience? Yes. Um, so student pushback to group-based methods is a, is a really common downside and I think source of anxiety for moving to group-based or team-based methods. And uh, it happens all, every time, especially in your case, the higher performing students uh, concerned about the lower performing students. And, and I think the, the, the two most common solutions for that are one, uh, consistent groups. So keeping groups the same through the semester uh, so that they start to get a, a handle on each other's roles. And two, the, the dirty business of group evaluation of having students rank how the others did so that you do have a report on those students who might have uh, been you know, slackers, so to speak, and letting the students know up front that that is going to happen. Uh, which usually uh, belays all those, those concerns. You know, don't worry, you will have a chance to make it known at the end. Uh, and there's an interesting way to do that where you actually don't give the students enough points to give all their the students full points to make sure you're getting some thread of honesty through even the nicest students. Um, but in my mind, it starts at designing the material so that it needs more people to work on it. I, I can give a quick example because I happen to have it ready. Um, so for some examples, we, when we couldn't take the students out to the field for sampling, we gave them uh, virtual sampling experiences. One was for a, a fruit farm where we would have them draw a line through the field and we would give them photographs that they took from those walking paths. And they had to have taken those paths carefully. And so they worked as teams so that every person took a different path, got different photos 
and then had to come together and write the report together uh, for the exam. The one I'm showing now is a nematode simulator. So we had a field with different nematode pressure on the right, but the students didn't know that. They had to choose where they sampled for nematode values. They got only the graph on the left, which is nematode content, right? And then they had to come up with a management plan based on only their data. And that's again, something they did in team just like they would in person. And so I think designing team activities that the students might do in teams one day professionally helps them connect the application of it. And uh, I think it's harder when you're doing like multiple choice and, and regular exam material. Great, thank you. Other questions for Chase? Chase, I'm curious about, um, I mean, this is related to Steve's question a bit, but I'm curious about student reactions. I mean, you, you mentioned some kind of reactions and some kind of pushback, but when you read evaluations, uh, was there anything there that surprised you or unexpected? Well, there was a lot of uh, empathy from the students, which is nice. A mm -hmm. lot of, uh, you know, statements like considering they did a really great job. And I think it's important to know, um, just like I hope we've been empathetic with the students and understanding that they're having challenges that we don't usually see from them. Uh, students, for the most part, have been really understanding of where we're at. And that's even easier when you're open and honest to them from the beginning about it. Hey, uh, y'all, this isn't our ideal method of delivery either, but we're going to all work through this together. I really felt a lot of, I didn't feel like there was a lot of anger from the students. And in a way, it's because we weren't being blamed on it. If there was any anger, I think it was probably towards, towards the pandemic. And um, not in a bragging sense, but I think this really speaks to how strong my TAs were. Because uh, again, with all, the exception of only a single uh, section for each of these labs, I had my TAs doing the run of the work, actually doing the demonstrations at the bench and, and, and doing things. But I got so many like best TA I've ever had, best, uh, so engaging. I think because we built this with that understanding from the beginning, um, we got a lot of superlatives. So I don't think it has to be painful and I don't think it has to be a horrible experience. A good, good inspiration for your TAs too. If they can make it in that situation, they can make it anywhere. I told all my TAs, if you're applying for anything teaching related, detail every part of this that you are involved with. I generally would cycle through TAs and have a different one help me build every lecture so they could see the difficulties and the problems in, a, in, a, in kind of a safe way. Um, we had TAs, uh, even undergrads, we had to take a turn. Um, and they saw parts of the teaching process that uh, they, they wouldn't always have in person. There's a lot of things I usually would have handled in the back room away from eyes that I just needed help with. And it was a more collaborative effort than usual. I, I have a question yeah, of course. for the presentation is really inspiring. Uh, what, what about the evaluation? You mentioned that you were doing group-based evaluation. Yes. and. That also the the conventional one, the standard one, or only that? Oh, how how yes, do you manage the evaluation part? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess in one in, in what sense specifically uh, do you mean? Because we did it a bit differently depending. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you mean for for the uh, semester long groups? Yes. So for the semester long groups, um, they were used to using a specific interface. Uh, we use Canvas as our system. Um, does Iowa State still use yes. um, Blackboard or? Canvas. Canvas, oh, yeah. I miss Blackboard for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> but, uh, oh my goodness, I could rant about the accessibility, how hard it is to do accessibility options in Canvas. Um, but they were already used to using that interface. And so we had them evaluate each other through the Canvas interface. We had them do a practice evaluation in the middle of the semester. Um, didn't actually uh, factor into their grades, but it was a bit of a warning bell to the students in the group who might have been under contributing. Because again, the input was, was anonymous, but it gave all the students kind of a, hey, just so you know, this is kind of what your group thinks of you. And uh, it allowed a place, uh, we, could, we also told them, you know, in the assignment, here's kind of some of the constructive ways you can yeah. talk about this rather than just pointing fingers around. Let's talk about, I've seen other classes, I didn't do this, but actually talk about the different roles a group can take and having students apply to those based on their personality about explaining to students that not everyone is a leader, but that's okay. The leader doesn't have to also take all these other roles. And um, I think that's something that would be, I would like to use in the future is, 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 is letting students know other roles can exist in a group. And it's okay to, to break the work up in kind of heterogeneous ways. We had students do filmed video projects instead of poster projects 
for the 400 student class when they usually would have been doing this big poster exhibition in the library and stressing the students that three students, one three minute video doesn't mean you each film, produce and write one minute of a video. You apply your skills differently. If some of you are better at writing, organizing video clips, finding sources, you, you stratify that. And so usually we would try to have them have that, that waking up moment in the middle and then the real evaluation uh, comes at the end. And that's the one that plays back into their, their individual grades. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Chase? I have a question. Yes. So Chase, uh, I'm going to the beginning of your talk. Uh, these three classes, did you uh, took over from other professor or were classes you proposed to the university and how that worked for you that the, you started uh, from zero or you had somebody? Great before? question. Yeah, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I actually should give a great deal of credit to my predecessor. So I took this position. Um, it's a hard choice, actually. I, I, I chose between this and a, uh, a postdoc extension that I had available at the time, and it, and it was a really tough decision. But uh, I'd really been itching to teach for a while. I was missing it. I was two years out of it. And uh, there's so much mycology and fungi at Cornell, and the person who had the position before me was promoted up to uh, a higher um, tier teaching position at Cornell as a whole, actually up at the university level. And so the position opened at the right time. And I said, oh my goodness, I can work with all these fungi classes. And oh my gosh, I didn't, I should, the amount of specimens we have, you know, I've got tephrina leaves from 1927 that we just have as these beautiful specimens. I've got this entomoptera fly uh, slide that was just, just written 97. And I thought, wow, that was made in 1997. It's in really good shape for that. No, it was made in 1897. So oh. I'm working not only off of a huge amount of material that I was able to move from, but a huge amount of previous work. So my predecessor was a very organized person and had binders and binders literally of plans and scripts and, and had had to go through the sudden change to virtual in the middle of, uh, of spring 2020. And so uh, I had course frameworks and I had a bit of a roadmap for what virtual teaching might look like. But that virtual teaching having to be done so quickly, and I do not, I, I really, uh, you know, don't, I emphasize for her in that situation. Um, it was largely videos and just text and, and stuff. But it was, it meant so much to use that as a roadmap. We weren't able to use most of it verbatim because we couldn't do the same kinds of labs that had been planned, but they were kind of inspiration, inspired starting points. Uh, so, so yes, this was not out of nowhere. Um, and I think, think teaching is often like that. You're, you're building off of, uh, off of the, of what was made before. The, and thank goodness, because we had to write all of the group stuff from scratch and all of the prompts, um, as well as a lot of the, uh, the online actual material. So yeah, I should say specifically, uh, much appreciation to Mary McKellar of Cornell, who, uh, who, if she hadn't have had such detailed notes for me, I wouldn't have already had the calendar ready to have the corn and bean and um, geranium and cotoneaster growing and inoculated at different times so that I could focus on how the heck I was going to show these things virtually. <laughs> well, we're, we're over the hour, uh, Chase. Really appreciate your time. Uh, uh, this has been a very, uh, very exciting. Uh, uh, you're obviously a pathbreaker, and uh, I think Cornell's very lucky to have you. Thank you. Uh, Let me. Uh, if, 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 if you don't mind, let me uh, close with just one video that I can't help but show off. Uh, this was amazing. Um, I managed to bind our, one of our cameras to a needle and pick up a slime mold uh -huh. uh, from the, on the tip and uh, carry it up. And uh, although the video doesn't continue here, I was able to actually follow it all the way to the microscope slide to show it get deposited there. And uh, if you take anything back from this, how else would you ever show a student that? We can show students really amazing things using cameras and screens and projections. So keep that in mind uh, for classroom technology. Fantastic. And Marks, thanks so much for reaching out to me. Oh, you bet. And, and don't be surprised if some people from here are emailing you every now and then about uh, uh, some advice about your uh, technology and the way you mastered it, so. Please do. I can let you know uh, what technology worked, what technology didn't work, and uh, software, nice. anything else, be happy to. Thanks again, Chase. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank, thank all you all. Uh, happy good. Friday. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much.